Welcome to the topic, Drugs for Gastrointestinal Disorders. We will talk about the digestive system and all the disorders related to our gastrointestinal system. So first is the digestive system, which breaks down the food, absorbs the nutrients, and eliminates the waste. So this is a picture showing us starting from our mouth, oral cavity, and going all down towards the anus is our complete digestive system. So the digestion actually incorporates the GI tract and accessory organs. This is the process by which the body breaks down ingested food into small molecules and that can be absorbed. Peristalsis, which is the movement, nothing but a smooth muscle contractions that propel the substances along the GI tract. The timing is critical always for the absorption. So we'll talk about the peptic ulcer diseases. So peptic ulcer disease is caused by the erosion of the mucosal layer of the stomach or the duodenum, as we can see in this picture here. So this is actually the mechanism that how it happens. The gastric acid juices, we can see they are acidic in nature. When the excessive amount of the gastric juices are released into the stomach, it causes the excess secretions breakdown and lining of the stomach, it forms the ulcer. So we can see how the ulcers are being made here. And finally, the duodenal ulcers are the same thing. So lifestyle and factors like cigarette smoking, stress, alcohol consumption, more of the caffeine consumption, use of corticosteroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs, they are one of few factors for causing the peptic ulcer disorder. Also, the natural defenses against the stomach acid are in our body that in the gastric lumen, the gastric pH should be number two. Bicarbonates always help and barrier neutralizes the acid in the body. But other than that, we also have to watchful for all these risk factors to get away, not to get the peptic ulcer, peptic ulcer disease. So the primary cause for the peptic ulcer disease is infection by the bacterium named as the Helicobacter pylori. But the non-infected patients, the most common cause is the NSAID therapy. They are taking more, more of the NSAIDs. Secondary factors include the hypersecretion of the stomach acid and the hyposecretion of the adequate mucus protection also. How to cope with this peptic ulcer disease? Number one, reduce the emotional stress through the regular exercise, yoga, and meditation. Number two, no food or drink two hours before bed. It will not give you the peptic ulcer disease. Avoid alcohol as much as. Eat smaller meals instead of the bigger portions. Keep food diary to track the trigger foods and try to avoid them. Then is the duodenal ulcers, the gnawing or the burning upper abdominal pain that occurs one to three hours after a meal. The pain is worse when the stomach is empty and often disappears following the ingestion of the food. Nighttime pain, nausea, and vomiting. If the erosion progresses deeper into the mucosa, bleeding will occur. And many duodenal ulcers, they heal spontaneously as they are the ulcers. They occur most frequently at the age of 30 to 50 years. Gastric ulcers, they are less common than the duodenal ulcers. They're relieved by food and pain may continue even after a meal. Loss of appetite is there, weight loss occurs, vomiting is one of the symptoms. Then the severe ulcers may penetrate through the wall of the stomach and then cause the death eventually. More common in those ages with the older than 60 years. Then we talk about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. The stomach acid contents move upward into the esophagus and the loosening of the sphincter located between the esophagus and the stomach is usually the cause. It causes the burning that is heartburn and may lead to the ulcers in the esophagus. It is strongly associated with obesity and losing the weight may eliminate the symptoms. Many of the drugs prescribed for the peptic ulcers are also used to treat the GERD. Inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, which is one of the ulceration in a small, lower small intestine, ulcerative colitis, which is called a UC, it is the erosion in the large intestine. So these are the IBS which has small and large intestine disorders. They are treated with the anti-inflammatory medications and some immunosuppressants, but if only in the severe cases. Now talk about more that peptic ulcer disease, which can be treated by a combination of a lifestyle changes always and for the pharmacotherapy. Drug treatment is the first one is proton pump inhibitors, H2 receptor blockers, 
antacids, antibiotics, and miscellaneous drugs. But the goal is to provide the immediate relief of the symptoms, promote the healing, and prevent the reoccurrence. So this is the drug treatment mechanism of action of all the anti-ulcer drugs. The first one is telling you the proton pump inhibitors in first picture A. Here, they bind to the enzyme hydrogen ion, potassium, hydrogen, potassium, ATP, A's enzyme and prevent the acid from being secreted. Number two, if we are using H2 receptor antagonists, they occupy the histamine receptors and they prevent the acid secretion. Number three, if we are using the antibiotics, they're going to eradicate the H. pylori bacteria, the primary cause of the peptic ulcer. If we are using the alkaline antacids, they will chemically combine with the acids to raise the stomach pH. So this is all about the mechanism of actions of the four different types of the drugs that we use for the treatment of peptic ulcer disorder. Proton pump inhibitors, we're going to talk about in little detail everything. Proton pump inhibitors, they are effective at reducing the gastric acid secretion. They act by blocking the enzyme. Their name is inhibitor. So they are inhibiting, they're blocking. What they're blocking? They're blocking the enzyme, which is responsible for secreting the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And that was H. pylori. They also reduce the acid secretion to a greater extent than do the hydrogen receptor blockers and have a longer duration of action. Their beneficial effects last three to five days after the therapy is stopped. Other than that, the drug of choice for the treatment of the peptic ulcer disease and the GERD, it is having an adverse effects. Prolonged therapy PPI can interfere with the calcium absorptions and causes the osteoporosis and fractures. There is H2 receptor blockers. They reduce the secretion of gastric acid. So they are also blockers. So they are blocking. What they're blocking? Gastric acid secretion. They are responsible for increasing the acid secretion in the stomach. Cimetidine is the name of the drug, which is tegamet, and other drugs that suppress the volume and acidity of the stomach acid. Also, which is used to treat the symptoms of the GERD, which is a prescription drug, cimetidine. Adverse effects are very minor. Patients should be advised not to take antacids at the same time as the H2 receptor blockers because the absorption of these drugs will be lessened for that. These antacids, they rapidly neutralize the stomach acid and they reduce the symptoms of the peptic ulcers disease and gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the third category we use is the antacids. So these antacids, they're alkaline, inorganic compounds of the aluminum, magnesium, or calcium that neutralize the stomach acid. They are combinations of aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide, which is the most common type we use outside in the market. Combination products, they combine the antacids and H2 receptor blockers into one single tablet. You don't have to take more. This is cymethicone, and it is available OTC. Any antiflatulant, that is anti-symmetricon, it's sometimes added to the antacid preparation too. It also helps to reduce the gas bubbles that causes the bloating and the discomfort in the body. Then we use antibiotics. So antibiotics are administered to eliminate the bacteria, which is Helicobacter pylori, which is also the cause of many peptic ulcer diseases. So this bacteria is associated with 80% of the duodenal and 70% of the gastric ulcers. They're slightly tight, sticks to the GI mucosa and causes inflammation by increasing the acid secretion and reducing the bicarbonate secretion. So infection can remain active for throughout the life and elimination causes the ulcers to heal and remain in the remission longer. So antibiotics that we use to treat the H. pylori, it's amoxicillin, clarithromycin, metronidazole, tetracycline, or two or more antibiotics are administered usually with the PPI to increase the effectiveness of a therapy. Bismuth subsalicylate is one of the drug which is added to inhibit the bacterial growth and prevent the bacterial adhering to the gastric mucosa. They all are our OTC, not OTC, but the prescription drugs. Then there are some miscellaneous drugs which are also beneficial in treating the peptic ulcer disease, which includes sucralpate. Sucralpate is a sugar plus aluminum hydroxide and antacid which produces a thick gel-like substance in the body and coats the ulcer, protecting it against the further erosion and promoting healing. We use misoprostol. It's a prostaglandin-like substance. It inhibits the gastric acid secretion and stimulates the production of protective mucosa. 
the primary use prevention of the peptic ulcer disease for the patients taking high dose of the NSAIDs. Then is the metoclopramide. It is used for the patients who fail to respond to first line agents. They are most commonly prescribed to treat the nausea vomiting associated with surgery or cancer chemotherapy. They are available by the oral IM and IV routes and the CNS adverse effects of the drowsiness, fatigue, confusion and insomnia can occur. Then is the next is lexatives. So lexatives are actually used to promote the defecation in form of the constipation. So constipation is nothing but a difficult or infrequent bowel movements. They're caused by the lack of exercise, insufficient food or fluid intake and the low dietary fiber. So we should have drink a lot of water every day. Some medications, they promote the constipation as well, like opioids for the painkillers, antihistamines, antacids, and iron supplements. They all cause constipation. So to remove the constipations, we use the lexatives. The first is the bulk forming lexatives. They absorb the water, add to the size to the fecal mass, and they prevent and treat the chronic constipation. But the onset of action is slow. It is not used when rapid and a complete bowel evacuation is necessary. Then is the stimulant lexatives. They promote the peristalsis by irritating the bowel. They are rapidly acting, more likely to cause diarrhea and cramping very quick and should only be used occasionally. It may cause dependence and depletion of the fluid and electrolytes. Then we use saline and osmotic lexatives. They cause the water to be retained in the fecal mass. They produce a bowel movement in one to six hours and they should not be used on a regular basis. Possibility of the fluid and the electrolyte depletion occurs. Do we have some stool softeners or surfactants? They cause more water and fat to be absorbed into the stools. They're used to prevent the constipation. And some miscellaneous lexative drugs, they act by mechanism other than the above. Then opioids. Opioids are the most effective drugs for controlling severe diarrhea. So where we studied about the constipation, so we're going to talk about diarrhea as well. It is the increase in the frequent and fluidity of the bowel movements. It can result in the significant body fluid loss and when prolonged in the acid base or electrolyte disorders. It is not a disease, but a symptom of an, any underlying disorder. So we need to remove that underlying disorder and the diarrhea will be gone. We also sometimes use the opioids for the treatment of the severe diarrhea, which becomes the drug of the choice for acute or the long lasting diarrhea. It gives rapid onset and effectiveness at doses used for diarrhea. Opioids do not produce the dependence or the serious adverse effects for that. The most common opioid antidiarrheal is diphenoxylate, which is a controlled substance, loperamide, which is imodium. It is an opioid that carries no risk for the dependence and is available OTC always. Then also we have some of the vomiting sensations, nausea as a GI disturbance. So antiemetics can be prescribed to treat all these things. Nausea and vomiting is actually symptoms associated with a wide variety of the conditions like food poisoning, early pregnancy, extreme pain, migraines, head injuries, trauma to the abdomen, inner ear disorder and emotional disturbances gives you the symptoms of the nausea and vomiting. And drugs can also cause nausea and vomiting as a side effect. But the goal of us is to remove the cause whenever feasible. So how we can remove that? We can use different classes of the drugs as antiemetics, like antipsychotics, antihistamines, serotonin receptor blockers, glucocorticoids, and benzodiazepines. Then we talk about a bit of obesity. So we use some anorexians and lipase inhibitors, which are used to manage the short term of the obesity. So lipase inhibitors or Lestat, it blocks the enzyme lipase in the GI tract, which blocks the absorption of fats. It may also decrease the absorption of other substances, including the fat-soluble vitamins and comedin, which is warfarin. If we talk about the anorexians, bupropion, which is a sympathomimetic drug, it has a mild appetite suppressant effect. No other anorexians are approved for use in Canada. But anti-diabetic agent, which is liraglutide, it stimulates the insulin secretion, reduces the glucagon levels, and slows the gastric emptying, thus reduces the appetite. Exact role remains to be established. Then we use some pancreatic enzymes, which are administered as a replacement therapy for patients with pancreatitis, inflammation of pancreas, or malabsorption syndromes. So these pancreatic enzyme supplements, they are obtained from the pigs, 
They contain the necessary enzymes to digest the fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. And pancreolipase is an enzyme, which is cotazine, pancrease. It has significantly more enzyme activity. So the drugs that we studied so far, antacids, aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate with magnesium hydroxide, megaltrate, magnesium hydroxide, milk of magnesia, magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide with cymethicone or sodium bicarbonate. Antidiarials, we can use the peptobismol, bismuth salts, diphenoxalate with atropine and loperamide. Antiemetics, we get as the dexamethasone, doxalamine, maclizine. Antiemetic combination, anticholinergic scopolamine, it comes as a patches also. Antiemetic antihistamine, dimenhydronate, diphenhydramine, hydroxyzine. Antiemetics, both phenothiazine and antihistamine is promethazine. Antiemetics corticosteroids is methylprednisolone. Antiemetics phenothiazine is perfenazine and perchlor, prochlorperazine. Antiemetics phenothiazine like combination is metoclopramide. Antiemetic serotonin receptor blockers, dolacetron, granicetron, ondansetrons. H2 receptor blockers, cimetidine, famotidine, nizatidine, renatidine. Lexatives, bulk formings, polycarbophil calcium, uh, calcium mucilloid. Lexatives, miscellaneous type is emollient, mineral oil can be used. Osmotic, lactulose, polyethylene glycol, saline type is the magnesium hydroxide. Stimulant is the bisacodyl, castor oil, and senna. Stool softener or surfactant type is the docosate and proton pump inhibitor, esomeprazole, lensoprazole, omeprazole, pentoprazole, rabiprazole. So in this topic, we understood about the digestive system, which breaks down the food for a body to use the remove and remove the waste. Erosion of the mucosal layer in the stomach and the duodenum will cause the peptic ulcer. And the combination of the lifestyle changes again with a healthy eating and a healthy lifestyle and a pharmacotherapy inclusions of antibiotics for the H. pylori bacteria are incorporated in peptic ulcer treatment. Other than diarrhea, constipation, nausea and vomiting, they are the symptoms and treated with the drugs, but the cause should be sought out. And the certain medicines, they assist in the short-term management of the obesity as well. We also use some replacement therapy called as enzymes, which are provided when the pancreas does not function or for the malabsorption syndromes. Thanks for watching.